excited to have you you at the ECCC's Monthly Climate Cafe. That's the Environment and Climate Crisis Council from Democrats Abroad. Today, we welcome DA's Africa Committee to our informal forum for an important discussion on climate change and environmental justice in Africa. On the eve of the 27th uh, COP, which will take place in Africa in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, it's an especially propitious time to engage in this discussion. With the vast legacy of colonial history, extracting resources and exacerbating poverty across the African continent, parts of the region are amongst the worst hit regarding climate change through floods, desertification, droughts, and climate-induced chronic food insecurity. As you all likely know, Africa is one of the lowest contributors to the greenhouse gas emissions causing climate change, yet key development sectors have already experienced widespread loss and damage due to human-induced climate change, including biodiversity loss, water shortages, reduced food production, loss of lives, and reduced economic growth. Nonetheless, across the continent, great promise has emerged in investments in renewable energy. From the vast solar farms of Morocco to laudable green hydrogen projects in Namibia. South Africa, in fact, just announced this week approval of an 8.5 billion investment package to accelerate the country's transition away from coal and towards clean energy. We are really privileged to bring you two fascinating speakers today, Carrie Dickinson and Phil Mel Foote, to educate us on, the, on climate change and environmental justice realities on the ground in Africa. We will hold, um, questions until, hold the questions until both of our guests have spoken. I will introduce our first speaker, Mr. Dickerson, and um, the chair of the Africa Committee, Elizabeth Myers, will introduce the esteemed Mel Foote. So I am honored to introduce Carrie Dickinson um, as our first speaker today. Mr. Dickinson is based in South Africa and has spent most of his pro professional career supporting international development organizations, addressing development challenges by advancing their resource mobilization, project management, and insti institutional development initiatives. In his most recent endeavors, he has been facilitating trainees, trainings and consulting for public and multilateral organizations as an independent resource mobilization consultant in over 15 countries in the Caribbean, in Central Asia, East and Southern Africa, Europe, and North America. Thank you so much for being with us today, Carrie. Take it away. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dana, for that great introduction. Uh, thank you, Angela, for the invite. And thank you, Liz, for keeping me on top of uh, my game. And so I really appreciate everyone here. I'm going to try to share screen, but oftentimes I know with technology, things go awry. So I may get Angela to do it, but let me see if I can share a screen. And uh, one second. Can you see? Yes, we can see that. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. I just got a few slides. I'm going to try to speak fast so I can uh, want to make sure I get the, the esteemed male foot. Um, um, someone I actually, actually look up to. So going to... Going with the first slide, the first the first two recommendations, as we know why we're here, is oftentimes they're doing right by Africa with climate change and environmental justice. But the number one thing that we have to do is, is a reminder, I know I'm speaking to the choir, is what's at stake is vote. Whether it be us or our family or whoever, it's just vote. I want to reemphasize that. We can have all these discussions and infomercials and probably what I just said. Dana probably took some of my bullets. You can get some from the YouTube. But if we don't uh, take action, all of this is null and void. And number two is engage in strengthening democracy for all. And that's going to come up throughout my discussion. Democracy is more than just voting, just more than just the electoral system. And obviously, we're doing this here, but just want to continue to encourage and, and remind. So just want to make sure those are my just main two recommendations, vote and engage of everything I want to say. Secondly, 
as um as Dana mentioned, um the COP two seven and Egypt, so two big events are coming up. Obviously, what they call the conference of parties, and then also our midterm elections. And so this talk right now is 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 very very timely. Going to the presentation, we what they call we have what's called the new normal, the new normal of global climate change. Everyone knows, but exactly what happens. So right now we're at one point one Celsius. Look at the number of heat waves beyond what the normal trends say. In a couple of six to 11 years, we're on trend to hit 4.1 um, more heat waves, two times more drought, um, extreme precipitation. Um, so under this new normal, scientists have come out and said this is what's going to happen. The UN humanitarian appeals have linked extreme weather, linked to extreme weather, have increased 800% in the last 20 years. Imagine 800% in just the last 20 years for the number of pills. But the one thing that we learned, and I'm going to go to the next slide, is we know is there's an old meme that always says, everyone is in the same storm, but we're not in the same ship. I'll repeat once again, everyone is in the same storm, but not in the same ship. And uh, different countries, different vulnerable groups, we've learned so much from the COVID lesson. Um, just go back, just rehash on COVID, and, and I got that as one of my one of my eight global overlapping crises that's going on. There's probably like 200, to be very honest. There's probably a lot more, but these are some just numb, some that are noteworthy. Obviously, debt distress. Um, we know, obviously, the U.S. has the power to print it, you know, print its own money. The, the dollar is uh, the, the foundation of the global economic system. But debt distress, South, East and Southern African countries or African countries, obviously, with new lenders with China, um, African countries now able to access private funding. The number of countries in debt distress has has gone up significantly with a larger portion of private um, funding. What that means is the higher interest rate. We're going to talk about country. I, I'm a little bit more familiar, even more familiar with Barbados because I just finished that consultancy. But they're saying they had some they had borrowed money, not only from the World Bank, but previous administrations had borrowed loans that had credit card type interest rates. 10, 12, 20% interest rates. And so that's something that we have to look on after. COVID-19 repercussions, as we know about, the war, the war in Ukraine. Obviously, as you know, being American, we don't feel these effects. It ripples as much. But 25, Ukraine and Russia are responsible for 25% of global wheat. Kenya imports 25% of wheat from both of them, from them both. Cameroon, 44% of fertilizer from Russia. And obviously, the strains on the, the fertilizer and the food, um, obviously causes the, the price of other food items and imports going to increase. As we know, Africa is a net importer of food. And that's another issue. Inflation, U.S. inflation rate is 8.2%. Look at Cameroon, Tanzania, I'm sorry. Inflation increased 34% between February and April. Cameroon, 26%. So I don't want to spend too much time, like you said, just going down. Obviously, everyone can, can read, but just saying the effects. Even the strong dollar, the amount of the strong dollar, one, increases the import cost for everyone. That debt servicing, most people got the uh, loans in, in um, U.S. dollars. I'm here in South Africa, and I've seen – I remember when I first came to South Africa, I think it was $1 to 9 Rand. I think it's about $1 to 18 now or so. And I remember a guy in Malawi, just personal experience, he said, you know, Kari, a dollar is just a dollar to you. But for us, I go from being able to buy my own clothes to now having to ask my children to buy clothes for me. So just, just some of the realities are for people on the ground – that what people go into obviously de democratic recessions not only from the u.s and january 6th riots but global increase in authoritarianism <laughs> global food and sustainable development goals things that we talk about right now that makes the news is food war and conflict even education um has taken a huge huge um uh, regression and so these are just overlapping crises in addition to the climate change and they're all inter interconnected the less funds that you have to spend the more funds you have to spend on food the less money you have for resilience and recovery and things of that nature from climate change so that's that africa as dana mentioned only contributes about approximately four percent of global emissions with a, approximately 17 percent share of the global population i know numbers change some people said two to three percent but let's just go to four percent but look at just the 2019 how much china and the china and the u.s contribute to global emissions and then you can even look go across from the last uh century or so how much how much uh, the U.S. has contributed to, to, to climate change. So keep that in mind, how much the U.S. ourselves contribute, uh, is ourselves as far as what we contribute. But look at how the perceptions on the next slide um, 
make you question the um, our fellow citizens' expectations. If you look at this, Gallup did a poll. I think it was this 2019, if I'm not mistaken, 2000, 2021, actually. Sorry, March 1st through March 15th, 2021. Look at that. Six in 10 adults in America think that global warming is already having an effect. 43% worry a great deal. But look at the gap between Democrats and Republicans. Um, the gap in Republicans already, uh, global warming already happening, only 29%. Democrats, 82%. This reemphasizes our role of getting that vote out, that the amount of contribution the U.S. has done over that period of time, and yet we still have people, a large percentage of Americans, not believing that global warming is having an effect. So it's just pretty interesting to see the different demographics of seeing who believes it's already begun and, and not. Very, very wide. Same thing, going back to saying another very interesting slide is look out the, the different perceptions over a period of time believe global warming will pose a serious threat in our lifetime. And so look at 1987 or 2011 or 2007, that you would think with the spread of the internet that people would become more educated and understand that global warming is having an effect. But, but due to politics, um, the number has gone from, for the Republicans, I think from 29 down to 11%. And so that's just a shame of seeing how the, uh, how the Republican Party has changed so much. I'm focused on it. I'm gonna to get to Africa in just a minute, but as we will know that our you know our work begins at home. If you look at Republican Governor DeSantis voted for funding um, for Hurricane Sandy in New York, but right when Hurricane Ian happened, all of a sudden he asked he's he's happy to ask President Biden for funding, right? And that's just I mean it's just a shame that to see that the same American. So this goes to saying saying that even in the U.S., um, empathy is in, in in short supply, and so there's something to be aware of. Get into Africa. We talk about the different climate change effects, and I didn't want to send just a bunch of pictures of people and um, going through distress. As mentioned, Africa is the most Africa, and also it's called small island development states like the Caribbean, Southeast, um, Southeast Asia, and some of the other countries have been the most affected by climate change. As a continent, Africa has been the most affected. The Horn of Africa right now is going through the one of the worst droughts ever. When I used to be in East Africa base, we had a drought going on then. Two or three years before I started in 2016, I can't remember what year, they, Somalia had a famine at, at that point in time. And so just going to show you that East Africa is extremely affected. Southern Africa, we have here, even in South Africa, in uh, the Durban area, Pe poor people have to move into some of the areas close to the city because it's cheap to live, but they want access to work. The areas, they call them, I guess, waterways, water courses, continue to flood. People get flooded out. They move away for a minute, get emergency help, and then restart their cycle all over again. West Africa, the shortage, the shortage of uh, f um, land causes disputes between pastoralists and farmers, and that leads to conflict. Some of they have some of that also in Kenya, I believe. So just go and say what the effects is effects are. One of the things, one of these article, and just to switch to the Caribbean, but it has a role in here. So sorry, I know we're in Africa, but I just want to say there's a case study, an excellent, excellent, excellent study on New York Times. Um, called the Barbados Rebellion. Caribbean nations are trapped between the global financial system and a looming climate disaster. One country's leader has been fighting to find a way out. This is an excellent story because it starts, it discusses uh, Mia Motley, which is, most of us are probably are very, very familiar, her battles with the IMF. She had to make a decision, the 30 second short story, she had to make a decision not to pay the IMF, which for a small country who needs that, who needs the ratings, who needs private investors, this is something that takes a lot of courage. One of the stories that just, I thought one of the lines was very interesting. The horrific paradox, of course, was that they're talking about after slavery, what, what happened to Britain. After Britain um, uh, eliminated um, slavery, they had to pay back the slave owners. Very similar situation to Haiti. Then the horrific paradox, of course, was that after the British banned slavery, they did pay reparations, but just not to the victims of the crime. I thought that was probably one of the most standout um, moments of there. Another aspect was IMF and other multilaterals have trouble measuring climate risk for insurance, so they don't know how to measure it, and so therefore they're literally they, they start recommending austere uh, uh, programming, very similar to what I think happened in Africa in the 1980s, maybe 1990s, and started making those I think they call it structural programs, and so a lot of these things exacerbated. So just give you an example of what happened. They recommended they recommended um, 
um, Barbados to sell some of their uh, state-owned enterprises near the beach to the private sector. So what is the private sector going to do, matter of fact? So not only do the people with money are your former colonialists, but then they're going to tear down all the plantation that helps with the climate change. And so now they're going to make the, um, the, the, the beach empty for tourists. So not only did you, not only did the recommendation that you IMF made or other people made, um, not only give the land back, not only back to a form of neocolonialism, but also exacerbated the climate change happening. Is there, the very last part is, and even in that, it was a grim ending that there's no way you're going to be able to afford your way out of climate change caused by other people. The Barbados, just like other countries, only contributes one percent or less than one percent to the global um, global warming. But look what happened to Dominica. Tropical storm Erica in 2000, 2015 and Hurricane Maria caused damages, losses of 100% and 228% of GDP. You're not going to finance yourself out of that hole. So just going and understanding the, the, the dire consequences going on. As mentioned, this is not Africa, but it's an excellent, excellent story. I, I recommend anyone to read it. Just be like a case study of what's going to happen to developing countries or what's going on in developing countries. The good thing is we talked about the COP27, now I've dubbed the African COP, what's being done. Um, just a little bit of just little, the little battle back and forth mitigation is, um, so climate finance is div divided into two different groups, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is designed to cut emissions, invest in renewable energy and things of that nature, which is typically preferred by developed countries. Um, almost like a tax break, like do these things to make it better. Adaptation is saying we are already in trouble. We need to build sea walls. We need to do these different things to change. But unfortunately, Private sector um, developing countries do not fund adaptation as much. So if you're looking at countries that, like Southern Africa, East Africa, who need to make adaptations to what's going on because they're already in the belly of the beast, now most of the funding is going to mitigation. So that's a problem. The next one is another conflict that's coming up. And I'm, I'm impressed by these countries that they got together before and said, we're going to continue to bring these issues up. Another one called loss and damage. Angela, please keep me on time. I'm, I'm trying to talk fast. Um, with my southern English as much as possible. So if I'm going too slow, please let me hear too, no, no, too long. Please let me know. You're going good. really fast, so you're good. I'm good. Okay, okay. Loss and damage. Loss and damage. Some people even called it reparations in a sense for climate change. Basically you're saying as countries go through different damages because of the weather, that they're going to get compensated. There's a fund available for them to use. Developed countries do not like that because compensation oftentimes has a term of you're legally held liable. And so that's one of the things that's still a battle that's going to be brought up. So after these African countries have, have come up with a pan-African response that we're going to push for these things. But I just want you to understand that it's not just everybody coming to, to a good idea and coming to agreement. There's pushback and people don't want to be held liable. Um, developing countries, as you mentioned, lens of, they have a lens of injustice and harm from the past associated responsibilities and liabilities are ongoing. Higher income companies want to frame the issue nearly around climate related risk without saying I'm going to take on some of the historical aspects or the current aspects of our contributions to climate change. And so that's that. So just want you to understand that it's not, a, not an easy way to go. Um, unmet unmet ple um, pledges. Developed countries promise $100 billion a year in climate fi finance by 2023. Um, and they never met that goal. There's a chart on the right hand side that you see that you can see where they have been coming up short every, every year. Now that they, because of the increase in temperatures and the, and the back funding needed, African countries said they're going to start asking maybe for $1.3 trillion a year because of not able to make that $100 billion, $100 billion amount. So a lot of countries are still, there's a conflict saying, hey, you're not making your pl pledges, your, your, yeah, your pledges. Second thing I think uh, Dana mentioned was uh, talking about the just transition and South Africans, South Africa's money. Just transition is basically developed countries, developing countries want to say, hey, there's not enough solar energy technology. There's not enough wind power right now to power everything. We still need a little bit of gas and fossil fuels to still make it. You made it that way and you're here. You've, you colonized and exploited some of our countries for this. But now the thing is they want to say that, hey, now develop, developed countries, U.S. or whatever, are saying, no, you can't. We're not going to fund, finance any of these projects. And developing countries are saying, no, this is not fair. We're, we understand there's a need for a change. But at the same time, you made it this way. Now you're telling us to do something different. And so you see also South Africa has a potential $8.5 billion fund. Um, and that part of that just transition is looking out for 120,000 20, workers. But even that has issues um, because South Africa wants to do some green automotions and some of the financiers are concerned about how the money is being spent, um, will be spent. 
So just a lot of times, the thing I want to say is once you hear large funding amounts, does not mean that funds will get there or get to the right people or the quality or style that you expected. So that's just something to keep in mind. So when we hear 8.5 billion, it sounds great, but just like the pledge of the 100 billion a year, it may not get there. And also there's, there's a pledge to end international finance of fossil fuels as mentioned, but the UK and US after the, um, the war in Ukraine and, and the need for Russia to cut off the, the gas lines, um, some countries have uh, backtracked on that claim. So just that. So just that. So that's one thing. What is the U.S.'s role in addressing climate change? Um, just Dana mentioned, there's so many different programs. I didn't even caught up that, and I know I had too many slides already. So just wanted you guys to get a, uh, everyone to get an idea of the size of the U.S. Its contribution to ODA. U.S. is one of the largest. Is the not one of the largest. The largest contributor to a funding. We're the largest as far as. Um, um, I guess we call it aggregate the total amounts, but as far as percentage, we still have a long ways to go. I think we're like 0.15% or even less. So I think one time someone asked, um, 0.015 or something like that. Someone asked one time some Americans how much they thought they gave the aid. And a lot of Americans said maybe 25% of our taxes go to somewhere else, but only America, a very, very small point. The UN recommends 0.7% and only I think three or four countries, um, have been able to maintain that. UK used to do it, but I guess with the new government and obviously the um, uh, the repercussions from Brexit, they had to pull back. And so just give you an idea. You see up there, um, United States um, PEPFAR or, or the PREPARE aims to provide $3 billion in that adaptation finance, what developing countries are wanting to do. But obviously the, the, it needs Congress for approval. And so depending on the midterms, it depends on how much, if that's going to be possible or not. And so the last thing is, I just want, don't want to take a long time. I know uh, I can't wait to hear mail. And uh, just one, one thing that I said before, number one, vote. And number two, engage. And so thank you guys so much. Thanks, everyone, so much. Sorry. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. What a fantastic pr presentation. I was trying to um, talk fast. I'm sorry about talking no, fast. No, fantastic I presentation. Sure. Uh, really wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to hold their questions. I'm sure we all have a lot of questions. And I'd like to hand it over to Elizabeth now to introduce um, Mr. Mel Foote for us, our next speaker. And then we can all ask questions together. Thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you, Dana. Yes, fantastic uh, detail, Carrie. Uh, mm -hmm. Great information. I want to, before I introduce Mel, um, well, I'm Elizabeth Myers, the chair of the Democrats Abroad Africa Committee, which is a new, one of the newest committees on, in uh, Democrats Abroad, established this year in January. And it's a recognition of the growing strategic, political, economic, and social significance of Africa to the U.S. Um, of course, there are deep historical ties to Africa among people of African descent in, in the U.S., and there are thousands of American citizens living on the continent, many of whom, oops, I just lost my, uh, there we go, <laughs> technical issues, uh, many of whom uh, have come back to their roots here. And we know that the overseas vote helped President Biden win in several key battleground states in 2020. And a significant but likely underestimated portion of that voting bloc is in Africa. And those who live here are feeling the effects of climate change every day. As Kari said, we're in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Uh, and here in Morocco, we're experiencing the worst drought in 40 years with record temperatures soaring into the upper 40s this summer. And that is not typical. It's, this has been more like living in Saudi Arabia or Dubai. And today in October, in the end of October, it's 35 degrees here or 95 in, in Fahrenheit, if you think in Fahrenheit. But crops are failing in many parts of Morocco, and this is having a big impact on farmers and families that depend on agriculture. And just one example that actually, I, I grow olive trees on, on my small farm outside of Marrakesh, and olives have been hit really hard this year. So we know that olive oil is going to be more scarce and more expensive, and the economic impact is going to be drastic because Morocco was the fifth largest exporter of olive oil in 2015. And as of 2022, it's not even in the top 10. So in other regions of Morocco, we have re record flooding and land devastation and people losing their homes into surging rivers. 
So climate change is real and it has an immediate impact on economies and people here in Africa. And of course, all of this is happening amid a colonial legacy of exploitation and injustice. And Africa is suffering the most from a problem it did the least to cause. So having said all that, the DA Africa Committee is really pleased to host this climate cafe, co-host this climate cafe to talk about these issues and, and also some of the specific innovations and efforts African countries are adopting and adapting to meet these challenges. So without further ado, I want to introduce um, Melvin Foote, who's the founder and CEO of the Constituency for Africa, which is a 25 year old network of organizations, groups and individuals committed to the progress and empowerment of Africa and African people worldwide. Uh, CFA's mission is to build public and private support for Africa and also help you shape US policy towards Africa. So for more than 40 years, Mel has traveled and worked extensively in more than 35 African countries. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer and teacher in Eritrea and Ethiopia, and he's participated in numerous high-level missions to Africa. He's also the founder of the African American Unity Caucus, which is a broad-based coalition to promote pan-African cooperation and link diaspora leaders with the African Union. He's a consultant to the World Bank, and he advises the African Union's uh, ambassador to the United States. Um, one thing in Mel's background I think is particularly impressive is that in 2010, he conceived the idea for President Bar uh, Barack Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. So he's also the re recipient of numerous awards and recognitions, including from the government of Senegal and the Congressional Black Caucus. And I was privileged to be president, present in 2018 when the former ambassador of the African Union to the US, the Honorable Ari Kana Chambori Kwao, presented Mel a Legacy of Leadership Award. Um, recently, the, the um, uh, CFA submitted a position paper to the Biden administration recommending, among other things, significant investment in energy infrastructure in Africa. And so I look forward to hearing some more about that. And uh, let me turn it over to Mel. Take it away, Mel. Great, great. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the East Triple C. You know, uh, uh, you're doing fantastic work. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, my world, uh, I don't know everything, but I'm involved in just about everything. Uh, I want to say, uh, Carrie and I go back uh, uh, many years. We, you know, we said, wow, oh, we know each other. Uh, I want to say that your presentation was just absolutely superb. Uh, I learned a great deal, uh, you know, with the data that you presented. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's very much on, on target. Um, so I like to, you know, you're supposed to come to these meetings being an expert or something. But in this case, I think I was a student. And uh, I'm going to look forward to, you know, uh, rereading and, and sharing uh, the video uh, for people who also, um, you know, need to hear this message. Uh, let me say, uh, you know, the main message of Constituency for Africa is don't agonize, organize, you know. Uh, don't just get mad, do something about it, you know. And if you take that purview, uh, yeah, I got that from my mother. And my mother always told me, don't just get mad because I always complain about what somebody did. She said, don't just get mad, uh, get organized and do something. And so I, I wanna, wanna throw that one out there. Uh, I have been working on Africa my whole career. I uh, started out, like I said, as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia and Eritrea back in 1973. And I've been working on Africa ever since. Um, you know, CFA is actually now more than, I need to change my bio. Uh, we're like 33 years old now, you know? And uh, it's a small organization with a big footprint. Um, you know, uh, the CFA has impacted uh, numerous policies uh, uh, on Africa, both Democrat and Republican. I see these are all Democrats, but uh, Jack Kemp was my vice chair for until he died you know, in 2009. Uh, so CFA always saw itself as a bipartisan uh, organization. And we saw ourselves as anybody who want to work on Africa, we'll work with you. Um, and so that's kind of like our, our position. So I have numerous friends who are Republicans. Uh, I work with the Republicans on the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act um, and a number of other, uh, you know, in order to get something done in the U.S. Congress and the administration, you really got to be bigger than just a party. You got to be almost 
about the people and uh, you know, how do we all get involved uh, in, uh, in addressing these issues? Um, I uh, uh, wanna say that, uh, uh, you know, CFA has been uh, 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 very much involved in the policy. We don't get the credit that maybe other people wanna take because for us, it's not so much what we do. It's not so much that we actually change things. It's more important that it get changed, you know? And uh, so uh, Young African Leaders Initiative, for instance, uh, President Obama came to power in 2008. Uh, the economy was in a, a dire position, uh, free fall, um, you know, and so he sent an uh, assistant to me and said, well, what do you think I can do for the first year without, a, uh, what can I do the first year without costing a lot of money because we don't have a lot of money. And Obama followed George W. Bush and uh, another Republican. And George W. Bush happened to have been the most effective president we've ever had on Africa. And if you ever talk to him about Africa, he probably couldn't even find Africa on a map, but his instincts were really good. And he picked up, a, put together a very good Africa uh, policy team led by Jedi Frazier. Uh, Colin Powell, of course, was Secretary of State. And, uh, uh, you know, and so uh, we worked with them. And uh, we, uh, uh, we were pushing then on, on uh, HIV AIDS legislation. And uh, at the time, uh, people were dying from AIDS and, and uh, you know, we didn't know how deep it was going to go. And we were trying to push uh, Bush. Uh, Ron Dillon, the former congressman from California, was my chair then. And we were trying to push uh, 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 Bush to, you know, commit $3 billion for a global response to HIV AIDS. Uh, he goes before the microphone at the State of the Union and said, $15 billion for HIV AIDS in Africa. And I have to say that we fell back. Uh, so my point is, uh, they're good on both sides, and you got to find you got to find the nexus between that, you know. Um, so uh, when Obama came to power, and you know, uh, basically they said, "Welcome to the White House, Mr. Black Man." And uh, you know, again, you know, the uh, the banks had crashed, uh, General Motors about to crash, Lehman Brothers had crashed, and uh, welcome to the White House. And uh, so Obama just said, uh, you know, put together some thoughts. They asked me to do what did I think could be done in that first year. So I said, one. Don't spend your time on these old guys, Mugabe, Bia, and Bashir. Uh, spend your time with the young ones coming up, the next generation. And they loved it. And uh, that became the framework for the Young African Leaders Initiative, which I think is probably the most effective program in U.S. history. Uh, you know, it is going to transform Africa. Uh, you're going to find out that some of the heads of state in Africa would be Yali alumni. You know, uh, some of the people, some of the issues that they're going to be concerned with are going to be issues like environmental justice and uh, climate change, you know, because they get it. Uh, but I think we helped them to, uh, to form the links uh, so that uh, it could be a cross-cutting issue. Uh, I want to say, Kerry uh, uh, said a lot of stuff. I mean, the information was just uh, spectacular, actually. And, um, you know, something that needs to be shared broadly. And I'm certainly going to do my part uh, to share uh, the slides and and the other data that was presented. Uh, you know, it's the world versus Africa. And, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, uh, this climate change, all the cities in Africa, all the capitals are under, under coast. And why are they under coast? Because they helped to facilitate the slave trade and uh, the removal of, of resources. So it's always been an uh, unequitable uh, relationship with Africa. Uh, they divided this continent up and made it 50 something countries. Some of these countries are not as big as New York. Uh, you know, and yet they call us up the country. They need an army. They need a U.S. embassy. They need the protocols. They need the car. They need all kinds of things because they call themselves the country. And uh, Africa really should be like five or six countries. So to me, the regional bodies make a lot of sense. And one of the targets for this kind of effort ought to be ECOWAS and SADC and, and the regional bodies, as well as the Africa Union, um, you know, in terms of our strategy. Uh, I want to get to... Uh, 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 Joe Biden. Um, you know, uh, I was asked early on, uh, this was two years ago, uh, why don't you uh, uh, provide some recommendations? Now, CFA is focused on Africa and the diaspora. We spend a lot of our time trying to bridge the gap. Uh, we tried to uh, get the African diaspora in the United States uh, more engaged uh, uh, in Africa. And uh, the biggest problem in America right now with all of this stuff is that most Americans are uneducated undereducated or miseducated about Africa, period. So when you start talking about a major uh, moonshot to, to address climate change, 
Uh, you go out to Nebraska or you go to Wisconsin or you go uh, some other parts of the country, they don't even understand why you're even mad about it. Why are you trying to do anything about it? And so um, what the CFA really tries to do, we, try, uh, we recognize the power here and we try to make sure that the U.S. Congress, the administration, uh, have the knowledge and the information that they need to make uh, uh, you know, wise decisions about this stuff. Um, so, uh, um, so, uh, so when Biden came to office, uh, one of his assistants approached me and said, uh, why don't you uh, provide some, some, some uh, uh, recommendations? Biden followed Donald Trump. And, um, you know, it was four years of hell, you know? It was four years of hell, uh, really, uh, from every aspect of the U.S. engagement with Africa. So Biden walks into office and wants to change, <coughs> excuse me, wants to change some of this. And um, so one of it was the approach, uh, they asked us to provide a recommendation. So we pulled together uh, experts uh, from the diaspora in uh, several different areas, trade, uh, healthcare, uh, uh, environment and others. And we, we, we pulled them together and, and um, did a couple round tables with them. And then we hosted a round table with the uh, the director for Africa for Kamala Harris. And, um, you know, we had about 40 people uh, online uh, to do this. And uh, we laid out uh, a strategy uh, for the Biden administration. Uh, it was an aggressive strategy. It was heavily uh, focused around uh, diaspora engagement. And what do we think was important? And uh, I think they were quite impressed with it. Uh, so I think the, the policy paper, uh, Elizabeth, you have it. I don't have a problem if you want to post it or, or share it. Uh, that's you know that, that's fine. Uh, you know, we encourage you to read it. Great. Um, but what Thank we you. more and more, we got a uh, we got the White House ear on this here, and um, you know they were talking about the new policy is going to be formulated. They were thinking it was going to happen a year ago, so they pushed us to do this as early as possible. So we did it in September two years ago, right after uh, Biden uh, came to power, and. Um, then we, uh, we uh, went through several different people in the administration, Molly Fee, who was the Assistant Secretary for Africa, Dana Banks, who was then the National Security Advisor for Africa. We had sessions with different, uh, you know, different people in the policy, and then we shared it widely with the State Department. Uh, we shared it widely with the U.S. Congress, uh, because you got to make sure these members of the Congress and their staffs are up to date on, on this stuff. Uh, it, you know, again, if the, you know, you're thinking that they're on top of it, but you would be surprised how limited uh, some of these members are when it comes to these issues. So when you want to influence uh, members of Congress, one, you should make them understand uh, in a certain kind of way that uh, one of the things at stake here is, uh, is, is popularity, elections. You know, this is a popular issue and uh, you know you should be a leader on this here. And you give them the right talking points and the right you know, background information, you would be surprised that when some of these members uh, know now or saying now, uh, who back then were not concerned about some of these issues. And so I'm just throwing that out to you uh, as a recommendation. Uh, in the policy paper uh, that we, uh, uh, you know, we're aiming for this U.S. Africa Summit, which is going to take place December the 13th through the 15th here in Washington. They're expecting 40 to 45 uh, African heads of state uh, to come to Washington to talk about uh, U.S. engagement in Africa and what we have to offer. Now, again, th this is follows the Donald Trump administration where there was no engagement, you know? There were no, uh, he famously called these African countries S-hole countries. And I'll tell you, all across Africa, they never forgot that. And so Africans stopped even coming to the U.S. for trade, you know, to get a visa in the U.S. was impossible. And so they, they turned and went to Abu Dhabi and went through Dubai and went to uh, uh, Turkey and went to other places, uh, forget about the unit. So when, when Biden came to power, he met an African political uh, environment that was not positive about uh, US engagement. And so this past two years, uh, they've been um, working very hard and I think they've done an excellent job to uh, rebuild the relationship between the US uh, and Africa. Um, so, uh, you know, on, on, on the trade policy, we, we emphasize Diaspora trade, you know, uh, you know, while you got Boeing and, and Coca Cola and Microsoft and all these big companies involved, it's much more than that. If we really want to impact uh, people, uh, telemedicine uh, would be a thing on healthcare. 
Uh, we, we, we recommended that they uh, help build pharmaceuticals in Africa, uh, pharmaceutical companies in Africa. Uh, we should be supporting them and finding technical support and, and financial support so that uh, when there's another COVID pandemic or whatever, Africa is better, in a better position to respond. Uh, we ought to use technology to our advantage. Uh, we have a Zoom call today, and uh, you know, it's, it's a very impressive audience. It's a very impressive group that you pull together. Uh, but it's on Zoom, you know. We're going to have this meeting, and Zoom, boom, boom. You know, we're off doing our other things. So, using technology uh, uh, to we edu- we 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 told the Biden people, uh, America, they're uneducated about Africa. So we're expecting them to do town meetings, seminars, workshops uh, around the United States. We can take ambassadors out there and other experts around uh, uh, these issues. And we did that for a goal. We went to 30 different cities and held town hall meetings to promote the trade bill. And uh, we went to a place like Little Rock, Arkansas, where Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, was in Uganda. We were in Little Rock, Arkansas with a town meeting on Africa. And it was absolutely amazing, uh, you know, the interest. And sure enough, when she got back, you know, she was talking about Africa uh, because her constituents were talking about Africa. Um, so I, I, I throw that out at you. Um, I want to say also this Ukraine crisis, and Kerry talked and touched on it, um, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, uh, Russia has cut off the gas and energy from Russia because of this war. And so, you know, in Europe and whatnot, uh, we, we're moving into the winter season and they're going to be freezing. And so they're desperately looking to Africa for gas and, 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 and uh, other energy. Uh, sort of. But a lot of the stuff that they're pushing is unsustainable. They're not talking about solar power. They're talking about coal. They're talking about oil and gas. Uh, they're talking about the same stuff that's been talked about before. And like I said, Africa produces very little of the, the greenhouse gases, but yet paying the biggest price. But we all seen the, uh, the reports around Africa and Mozambique and hurricanes and uh, uh, what have you. Uh, I was in Somalia uh, in the early 80s as Africa as country director. And um, I witnessed firsthand the famine and uh, animals dying and you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely shocking. Uh, the world owes Africa a lot more. Uh, it's not just about the United States, it really is the global. Um, you know, we really got to talk about World Bank. We really got to talk about the IMF. We really got to talk about the UN. Uh, all of this has got to be modified and changed in order for us to address this climate. I'm, um, uh, I can't say I'm optimistic at this point because we read the newspapers Every day, uh, whether it's out in California or it's in, in, in Florida uh, or it's in Europe or it's anywhere in the world, we're hearing about these disasters all over the place. But is, uh, is the world woke up and do anything about it? No. You know, they'll, they'll put a bandage on it. Uh, then you know, six months later, here we got another one. Um, and so uh, we're desperately to we're desperate to uh, to get this climate change agenda uh, on the uh, on the radar. And I'm ready to work with you and at least give you advice about strategy and, and, and ways you might want to go about it. But we think that, um, uh, we think that um, uh, you know, just from what I heard today uh, from Kerry's presentation, uh, I think we have a lot that we could do uh, if we just, uh, uh, you know, the town meeting we're talking about or the, the round table in Washington, I mean, we really should have a round table right before the summit. Not during the summer. The summer's going to have some discussion about environment for sure. But uh, I would say that e, uh, triple E C triple E E triple C should hold a meeting on the seventh or eighth of December around this agenda and invite some members of Congress to address if there's some uh, uh, African officials who are going to be around. Uh, maybe they can talk about. It. But it takes a lot to get that kind of thing organized because right now uh, uh, everybody's organizing all kinds of meetings. Uh, we've already held. Uh, three meetings leading up to the summit, uh, you know, already. And we're going to do something uh, with Johnny Kingasong, who is the, the director of PEPFAR now, uh, is a good friend of mine. We're going to do something with him around the, the health care agenda on uh, November 21st. And then we're looking forward to do something in early, you know, leading up to the summit. So, you know, if you wait to the summit and try to have the impact, uh, maybe you won't get it. I would say do an op-ed. You know, try to get the, something in the Washington Post or New York Times. You would be amazed at how they respond to what they see uh, in the media. Then once, once it's printed, you run it through social media and, and, and put it in everybody's hand. So one thing I would recommend that you do is an op-ed uh, leading up to the summit. 
why it matters, you know. Um, maybe uh, bring in Al Gore. Bring in Al Gore. He was a big fan of, of this discussion of what role is John Kerry. Uh, maybe John Kerry is the keynote. That's another way of putting pressure on him that, hey, people are watching this. Uh, I got to do more than just talk to talk. I got to walk to walk. So uh, I'm going to leave it there because um, yeah, I didn't know where I was supposed to go with this. But then when Kerry, I'm glad Kerry spoke first because I think he laid out the really the business of climate change uh, that need to be looked at. But for me, it's about, okay, we got all this business down. What are we going to do to change the paradigm? And uh, that's really where I, I, I enter to it. So I'm looking forward to the follow-up as opposed to just uh, uh, having this meeting, the cafe. It's a great idea. I mean, I applaud what you're doing. Um, you, know, you, you probably need to open the door and, and uh, you know, try to reach across the aisle. Now, uh, you know, when you talk about the Republican Party, Today, the Republican Party is not the same Republican Party of Bob Dole, Jack Kemp, uh, Paul Ryan, you know, that was a whole different animal. And what we got now is heavily lined up with, with racism, uh, really trying to uh, uh, dominate people of color and that kind of thing. And uh, so when I speak of the Republican Party, I tried to work with Trump. They sent somebody to me and asked me what could... You know, they knew I gave Obama the Young African Leaders Initiative. They said, what should be the big idea for uh, President Trump? So I told them, I said, I thought about it and came back with a concept of uh, uh, using the technology companies, uh, you know, Microsoft and all that, and, and Trump even take them to Africa to scale up. Another way of getting young people involved is through this technology. Um, you know, they didn't move on it. In fact, they sent Melania uh, to Africa with a, a, a safari hat you know what happened with that. Uh, so, you know, for me, uh, you continue to work and you continue to push uh, to try to make something happen. And uh, so anything I can do to assist you, I'm, I'm, I'm more than ready uh, to help. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Foote. What an insightful um, vision of what's been going on in, in African politics in the United States. Um, I'm sure we learned a lot from your experience and and, and your talk, it, it complemented so, uh, so well, the talk that uh, Carrie gave us. And I think it, they are, you're providing a lot of fodder for questions. I know we have a lot of questions from the audience. So I would like to open it up um, for either uh, Carrie or, or Mel, um, if you want to, um, Open your microphone, start, type star star hand up in the chat or write a question in the chat that we can read out. Um, please feel free. I know that Diana uh, Powers who specializes in energy in France did write um, a question in the chat. Diana, would you like to unmute and, and ask Mr. Foote? Sure. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. Foote. Um, I've heard, you know, there's a great increase in interest again in nuclear power and that the U.S. intends to um, be exporting nuclear power plants to Africa, some of them to be um, manufactured in Romania. These small modular nuclear reactors have just the same a nuclear waste problem that other plants have, and it just will disperse a great uh, radioactivity and uh, problem across Africa. What do you see happening? Do you, do you see that happening? Do you see a pressure to, for Africa to accept nuclear power when it is just full of renewable resources? Wow. What a Question. You guys are really bright. I didn't realize I was dealing with a, you know, such an intellectual audience. Really, I didn't. I didn't you know, anyway, uh, I think anything is possible. You know, uh, anything is possible. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, who's making money off of it. Uh, if you get some American companies that are exporting uh, nuclear technology some kind of way, and uh, it does make, you know, on the surface, it, it, it sounds like it doesn't uh, pollute and this kind of thing. But like you said, uh, very easily it can be converted to weapons. Very easily it could be an accident. Uh, there's all kinds of things that could happen because of it. And, and Africa got wind 
It's got solar, got more sun than anybody where else in the world. Uh, but, you know, our, we've been talking about solar for at least 30 years, 40 years. Uh, ever since I've been working on Africa, I've been hearing about solar. When I was in Somalia, I was working in refugee uh, camps. And uh, we had a, I can't remember, it was Oxfam uh, out of UK, uh, donated a, a solar, uh, a solar, uh, uh, what do you call it, a solar pump, um, you know, costing $125,000. And they, 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 they donated it to the refugee camp for refugee release. But they don't even have electricity or running water. I mean, so you had this big old monstrous uh, solar uh, pump that were not usable in that condition. You know, now I don't know what happened to that solar pump, but uh, it, it reminded me of a lot of the solutions in Africa need to come from Africa. Um, you would be surprised at what Africans are looking at uh, and I personally like the idea of collaboration. Uh, that's what I liked about the Yali. They came to the U.S. and they were I introduced to meet with all kinds of folks as part of their uh, training. Uh, but they went back to Africa. Some of them took ideals from the U.S. back to Africa. But I can say among this next generation, the young people, clearly uh, they're thinking about alternative uh, sources of, uh, of fuel. And I think that, uh, you know, the renewables is front and center, uh, food production, all of that uh, needs to be, but it, it really needs to be an African-driven uh, uh, situation. You, uh, Kerry talked about Bar, uh, Bar, 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 uh, the, the, the prime minister from Barbados. And uh, I agree, she, she, she's my shero. I met her in Dakar earlier this year. Uh, no nonsense, uh, but I think the idea she's putting down are, you know, there's a lot of lessons for Africa in this. Uh, Do you work with Arena? Do you work with Irena, the internet? Iran. Yeah. I haven't done anything with Iran. I haven't done anything with Iran. Uh, no, Irena. Uh, not I work sorry. With some not huh? Iran. Irena, the International Renewable Energy Agency. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've heard about them, but I can't say I've had a lot to do with it. Again, I mean, you know, you only work on what you work on, and uh, this is a new era for me. You know. I'm sitting there saying, well, gee whiz, I'm probably the dumbest one on the, on the call, you know? Uh, if you're talking about the energy, uh, I'm, I'm in this kind of situation all the time. I work with Harvard University on cancer and non-communicable diseases. And I go up there, the first time I went up there, uh, they, uh, you know, everybody there got a PhD and this and that and the other, and they read their papers and everybody. But then I, I, when I got ready to speak toward the end of the conference, I said, uh, you know, you're talking to yourselves. You know, you guys are all bright, but you know, how does this translate to Congress? Uh, if I don't know about it, that means Congress don't know about it. The administration don't know about it, you know? And so, wow. So we've had, I've been invited to several of their events uh, simply to talk about uh, how do you go about advocating, uh, you know, for, uh, they want a moonshot to address cancer. Um, you know, how do you advocate, how do you organize, what are some strategies to organize to address it? So I'm not, uh, you know, like I said, I'm just really getting into, this is a whole nother area, you know. I'm getting ready to retire. People don't believe that. I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm gonna still stay engaged, uh, you know, but uh, running an organization and doing all the things you have to do uh, is a bit much. I'd rather be more of a consultant and an advisor uh, going forward. Really, I'm, I'm writing my own book uh, about uh, a memoir, so, so to speak, and also um, uh, a strategy for the next generation uh, in Africa and the next generation here, the young people. Uh, I don't want to lecture them, but I want to know where we, let them know where we went to. So I think you ought to spend some time uh, really engaging the next generation, uh, both in the United States, uh, in Europe, and in Africa. You know, uh, it'd be very easy, I think, to, to pull the Yali alumni who, certainly, who came to the U.S. And I met, I must have met 10,000 of them uh, over the years. And I can say Thank I have you. Thank you, Mr. Foote. I, I think there are some other questions. People are waiting to ask some other questions. So we'll oh, yeah. get back to that. Um, I, we have a question from uh, Dash Nesbitt in the audience. Would you like to un, unmute and, and ask, or are you in a difficult spot? Would you like me to read your question, Dash? I'm in a bit of a difficult spot. If okay. you'd be able to read that. Well, I think this might be, um, this might be um, for, Carrie, 
Um, do you think the blunders of the Trump era has permanently burned bridges with African nations or is there space to rehabilitate relations? Any idea about uh, future African leadership with regard to Africa? Future Republican Re leadership. Republican, yes. Um, excellent question. Um, I think this might more be more male, uh, more development. But if I had to take a guess, um, <clears throat> uh, no, I think you know as far as um, I, you know, African leaders and uh, a, a good sized part of a society would understand that you know American administration has changed. You know, from as you um, as Mel mentioned, the George Bush was a was a was a very effective leader as far as the, providing PEPFAR. Um, obviously, Obama was, um, you know, uh, a son of the soil in, in, in a sense. And so I think people understood that Trump, you know, the Trump administration was authoritarian, uh, a bit clownish and things of that nature. And so I do think that there is definitely a place to re re rehabilitate. You know, the U.S. is such a large, large donor to Af African um, um, all, what they call official development assistance. Now, obviously, China has come along. Chinese, China has come along, and they provide what's called like non-concessional, non-contingent, or I think non-concessional or non-contingent funding, where they don't ask many questions. Where oftentimes America and other Western countries often have like what they call strings attached, as far as focusing on human rights, accountability, and things of that nature. Um, so not trying to sound like we're the, the greatest guys, but I think we do a great, America does a great job as far as trying to instill human rights and things of that nature while respecting culture. So to answer your question, I think there's definitely places to rehabilitate. Um, any idea about future Republican leadership with regard to Africa? That's sure. You know, in, in the past, as Mel mentioned, um, foreign aid had been pretty much a very bipartisan um, funding. But now just to recently with the new um, sort of radical Republican has now, you know, with the DeSantis and I think the governor of Texas and then uh, migrants to New York and other places uh, um, to more, I guess, what they call blue states, um, a much more stringent um, America first sort of uh, mentality. Um, I'm not for sure. I'm not, so, I'm not to be honest, not so hopeful. Um, obviously, I'm biased I'm being a Democrat, but not as hopeful right now where Republican stand. Um, um, uh, Republican leadership stands. You know, based on the day, you know, uh, you know, Utah is a very Republican um, state, but yes, yeah, because of their missionary work, they're very oftentimes open to uh, foreign aid and things of that nature. But right now, I don't see that happening with the new I leadership. I have another question for you, uh, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, personally, you are on the ground in South Africa. I don't know where in South Africa you are, yeah. but um, this was exciting news this week. This eight point mm -hmm. five billion dollar package. Right. Right. Uh, to transition away mm -hmm. from coal. Um, can you tell us more about that and the, the good, good, process good of question. getting there and uh, yeah. what what the status is at this point? So excellent, excellent question. I'll try to do my best. Um, I know it had come out a while ago. South Africa is one place in South Africa because South Africa, you know, obviously um, we're so used to load shedding, has been a very... Um, you know, um, dependent on coal, one of the heaviest coal users in the world, in, in the world, um, as far as percentage of population. I think there's one place, and please don't quote me on this. I should I should have googled this before I came. I think there's one area in South Africa that may be the most polluted in the world, or something of that nature. And I can't remember that. So you know, South Africa still has the old. Um, you know, just as you know, if you've been to South Africa, the Santons, the Melrose Arches, and other beautiful places here, but obviously it's the most unequal country in the world. So they still still have a lot of what I call the fruits of apartheid still there. Um, that 8.5 billion is is very, very exciting. The thing the only thing I can remember to be honest on the details, I remember South Africa started putting ideas around how to sustain this as far as the, as I mentioned earlier, um, having like a green automobile factory and, and and pushing that to service businesses, particularly in Europe and things of that nature. And some of the people were, uh, some of the donors were kind of hesitant about that. So with it just coming out, I'm excited. I mean, I think this is huge. I remember hearing people talk about it, but at the same time, you know, that 8.5 billion, just like that hundred billion, it gets how it's used, how it comes, what period of time, who it has access. So the thing about money, I hate to say is, you know, um, the argument, people applying for funding in Puerto Rico, sometimes people applying for funding in, in Florida, they found out oftentimes is people, you know, that old saying, if you, those who don't need a loan get it, is oftentimes people able to access the money 
are the ones who are educated, who who are have access to the computer, who have access to means, and oftentimes they're they're the most they're not the most vulnerable. But so, but to answer your question, and I feel like I'm rambling because I can't answer your question directly. But I am excited. But at the same time, I know there's still um, there's still talks about how the money will actually be spent. So, yeah, it is good news, and I think right. everybody is kind of on the edge of their excited. seat, right? Because South Africa is a powerful nation in yes. in Africa, and uh, yes, that it's there's been across the continent energy poverty those who who have relied mm -hmm. on these traditional fossil fuel sources and right. the countries um need to find a way of transitioning away from right. and and at the same time that people will be able to have light have have energy mm -hmm. we don't want to plunge people into right. energy darkness. poverty right and, and going to that too, going, going what you're talking about that just transition. Also, you know, just thinking about the the political aspects of it too. I remember seeing a report, and I don't know how true it is, but they're saying the number of ESCOM. ESCOM is a power facility here in South Africa. I think they have a monopoly on most of the power against share of it. I know some in Cape Town has some private power access, but the ESCOM is the largest provider of power here. And they said, you're right, you know, with that just transition, if you start laying off people, mm -hmm. how much does that affect the black middle class? That's right. You know, how much does that, you know, affecting, you know, obviously, even in America, where African Americans make a larger population of the uh, federal employment, I think, than, than actual population figures, you know, obviously, South Africa, it'd be even more. So that just transition is a very sensitive of, like, we need to change over. At the same time, how, how do you go about doing it? Mm. Mm. I see there's a question from um, Bob Kelly, Robert Kelly, in the audience, uh, which he's written. Would you like mm. to unmute and ask it, Mr. Kelly? That's Ambassador Kelly. Well, I'm, I'm uh, uh, in a <laughs> storm uh, in St. Croix, uh, but the beach is still nice. So uh, I don't want to risk it going in and out, but I think the, the question is fairly clear. If there's any more clarity to the question needed and I'll, I'll, I'll come back in. Um, he says, are we directly engaging those who can truly impact policy around the systemic discrimination around climate change that is experienced by Africa? What a great question. Would both of you like to take a crack at it? I'd like to take the first one. And by the way, there's an article in the Washington Post today entitled Climbing, uh, Climate Warming Methane Emissions rising faster than ever, study says. And the author is Stephen Muffson, M-U-F-S-O-N. Somebody ought to Google that and put it in. I think you will find it useful. Uh, I want to say, I, I was with President Ramaphosa uh, when he came to Washington last month. I was invited to a reception for him. Uh, and so I, I got a chance to really uh, buttonhole him on some things. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we ought to applaud the Biden administration reached to Africa. You know, they are trying their best I think the summit is a tremendous opportunity. They're trying to take on real issues. Uh, they're not going to take on everything. I think it's almost uh, overwhelming, uh, you know, what their ambition is. But I, I say that they're trying their best, and I try to do everything I, I can uh, to support them in this regard. We're not talking to a lot of the right people. I can tell you that from the start. Uh, we're, not, we're not talking to women the way we should. Uh, you know, the women are going to walk around with the wood on their head, you know. But are we out there trying to talk around uh, cooking uh, a firewood, you know, and they're chopping down trees to do it? Um, I, I don't think we really are. We, we're not there yet. We're far away from where we need to be on this because you're dealing with a lot of people in, in, in really difficult circumstances, and they're just trying to eat any way possible, uh, whether it's damaging to the environment or whatever. So I think that that's an area that we have a lot of work to do uh, to reframe the conversation uh, to engage uh, uh, definitely more younger people, you know. I mean, this room should be a bunch of under 30s, you know, uh, under 30, 25 to 30 year old range. Um, you know, but a lot of times we don't think about them because we're the ones with the PhDs and all the, uh, all, all the you know, uh, the recognition. But uh, if we're serious about this, we really got to talk about the next generation uh, taking this on as their number one uh, or one of the top issues that they're groping with. Gary? Oh, right, yeah, excellent comment, uh, Mel. Yeah, he, uh, he, made, he brings up a good point that the people most vulnerable to climate change are the women and children. 
Um, and unfortunately, and I guess in, in, in other vulnerable populations, um, just like what we learned from COVID, um, as we talked about the, we're all in the same storm, different ships, how the effects of COVID and, and, and whatever the dastardly thing that comes about affects the vulnerable minorities, the poor, um, uh, people living with HIV, AIDS or, or whatever, um, uh, infirmity or whatever. I'm going to the, to the Bishop, uh, going to Bishop Kelly's question. Um, are we directly engaging those who can truly impact policy around the systematic discrimination? I think I think the engagement, the, the notification is there. I just think is is the political will there. Um, you know, as as mentioned, um, um, you know, obviously with the different multiple crises is having going on, and oftentimes too, a lot of uh, developing developed countries don't want to take responsibility, right? They don't want to be held on the hook for either a saying I'm sorry because of this colonization or slavery, or whatever, and at the same time, I don't want to be held on the hook that if some, the next disaster that happens in the Caribbean which is bound to happen, they may not want to be responsible for it. So I think maybe the engagement, the, maybe the engagement may be there, but I don't know about the political, the w political will um, of those who, you know, who empower. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think people I would already know, and I'm sure that question has been asked, as we mentioned the COP27, African countries have, have, have come around and been asking that questions, but obviously they're not the ones with the purse strings or the, uh, the, the political power at the moment. And I want to also add that, you know, the companies like Shell and Chevron and, you know, Fossil, uh, don't underestimate their, their, their lobby ability. They're paying mm -hmm. tons of money to member of the Congress to help them get reelected. Mm -hmm. So, okay, they're paying for you, but you better know there's a price on the other end of that. And that price is the continuation of fossil fuels. Uh, and, you know, so when you look at the U.S. Congress and look at uh, policymakers really around the world, you'll find out who's putting up the money is the one who's going to get the action. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that should not be underestimated, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because they, they, they don't want to lose their business. They don't want to lose. Uh, so they're going to continue to tell you to keep pushing uh, diesel and, and gas uh, cars because uh, it's to their business. But you start talking about electrical cars. Uh, Rwanda is a case in point. Rwanda has done some remarkable things uh, around uh, the new technologies and transportation. Uh -huh. And I think there's some, some models out of Rwanda that ought to be looked at uh, for other countries, motorcycles or electric, that kind of thing. You go to some of these countries and even driving down the street in Togo or Benin, you, you, you almost suffocate from the fumes, mm -hmm. you know, but they haven't, uh, they have not done anything to, uh, to, address, uh, to address this, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. There, but there, in different pockets of of uh, the continent, there are fantastic uh, uh, innovations which are cleaning up the environment, which are helping um, the continent uh, transition to uh, mm -hmm. renewables. You've got solar farms, drip ir irrigation, uh, places that normally have no ac have had no access. Uh, to grid energy, mm. suddenly being able to use these technologies uh, that are off of the normal grid. You have mm. green hydrogen uh, plants being developed in, in Nab Namibia. And mm -hmm. the largest, um, as I mentioned, in Morocco is just stunning, these mm. solar farms, mm. which, which are an example for the the world for the United States of what can be done because in many areas of Africa you're you're going not from a place where everybody's connected in the grid to places that have never been connected to the grid mm -hmm. able to bypass that mm -hmm. um, with with solar energy with mm -hmm. wind turbine energy and utilize mm -hmm. these new technologies that come with it Mm -hmm. um, for agriculture. I have um, one other question uh, which has been on my mind and I'm wondering um, what your perspective is. There are severe droughts, um, floods in Nigeria, droughts going on in Ethiopia and Chad, uh, severe droughts. And to exacerbate that, the war in Ukraine which has been supercharged as a, a fossil fueled war, they're not getting the grain that they need to relieve these droughts, these effects of climate change. Um, it's, it's one problem compounded on the other. 
can either of you or both of you um, provide any insight, any remedy, any reflections on this incredibly pressing uh, situation? I personally think uh, you, uh, you know, what you're saying is absolutely correct. I'm sure that this is gonna be a high level conversation at the summit uh, along those very lines, which is good. Uh, but I think that uh, I would encourage uh, ECCC to get some information out because most people don't know this stuff. They're not aware of it. And um, a lot of these, uh, the leaders of these African countries are really looking out for their own money. You know, uh, they want investment. They want investment, they're, they're, they're screaming for it, but they want Chevron to come in or, or they want Kentucky Fried Chicken to, to provide some food. When in fact, you know, uh, Africa needs some sustainable solutions. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I don't, I think we got a long way to go in this regard. And I would, uh, I would recommend that you guys, uh, uh, you know, think about uh, a strategy to, um, uh, you know, to engage, I mean, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And I've seen uh, all kinds of uh, studies and all kinds of projects around Africa that are, are really very much in, in the right order, but they're not connected a lot of times. They're not being promoted. Uh, when I hear about Nigeria, I recall back in um, the 80s when they, uh, Ken Sarawiwa, who was head of the, uh, the I, I met, Ken came to see me in Washington. And then I went to, the, the next week he went home, they hung him, they killed him uh, because he was trying to fight for environmental justice in the in the region and um you know and so when you start and shell was right behind that you know they were saying this guy is messing with our business you got to do something about him so they sent the nigerian military and so forth to take him out so i don't forget stuff like that and i do know that a lot of these leaders are not uh they're not doing the right thing about the people you know um you know they're, they're, they're not t talking to talking they're not walking to walk uh i think is a major way forward, that's why the young people are coming up. Some of these coup d'etats you're hearing about in Africa is because of this kind of thing. The young people are looking at it saying, oh, these guys are continuing to do what they've been doing. Uh, and so the issues that we, that, that we need to grapple with are not being addressed. I believe, um, uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, Bob, did you have something you wanted to add? Yes, just uh, very briefly. Uh, um, I got a $4 uh, parking ticket recently uh, in a uh, very nice southern city in the United States. It was for $5. And uh, uh, I forgot to really make that payment properly. I mean, it was only five bucks. And so I recently got a notification that the ticket had increased in value to 55. And so they had tacked on to the ticket uh, uh, a $10 charge for um, uh, violent incidents that affected uh, historically disadvantaged, uh, a children's fund, um, a, uh, a cancer fund. And that's how those amounts increase. I think sometimes in the political and perhaps the, uh, uh, the, 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 the politics of dialogue is that we also fool ourselves about looking at the real realities. And I think we all recognize because it's been traditionally proven that on this subject, unless there's real strength on this subject, larger than the politicians, then Africa is going to end up last again. I believe that perhaps what we really should be talking about is helping leadership uh, in Africa, seeing, for example, that they have the wealth that all of the nations are going to need. And uh, um, we know that a lot of companies come in and they don't abide by the rules. Um, uh, and yeah, they perhaps are putting money on the table in a corrupt manner, but nevertheless, if we brought those prevalent fines to the table, then we could help monetize the issue so that Africa doesn't have to come to some politician's desk in Washington or some interest group uh, with hat in hand 
and yet they have the largest amount of resources across the globe. I think we should reverse the dialogue and the approach of the dialogue. Beautifully articulated. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Carrie, did you have uh, something that you wanted to add to the last? No, just add on. Just adding on to what Mel and, and Bishop said, um, I think I think there's 90 billion, if I'm not correct, 90 billion dollars worth of annual money that's that's illicit that, that escapes Africa without taxes or appropriate re revenue. And so Bishop brings up an excellent point. And then um, Mel um, also regarding, you know, I talked earlier about the different in which you talked about also the the multiple overlapping crises that are happening. Unfortunately. <clears throat> Africa, I think, has the most arable land in the world, but yet they're still a net food importer. And, you know, food is a very complicated thing. Is um, Africa has very uh, a large number of subsistence farming, um, where, you know, versus America. And I'm, I don't know the exact right one. Uh, food security is not my expertise or whatever, whereas, you know, Americans have tractors the size of houses or whatever. And so, you know, looking at different ways to scale up those programming, you mentioned um, earlier about the large different um, innovative uh, ideas that are going on. Sometimes it's just the trouble of scaling up. Sometimes is a different issue. You'll hear about a program working in the village, but can you break it work in the next 10 villages? Because of the infrastructure is so different, whether it be geographic regions or political aspects um, or cultural or, or historical grievances or whatever is very hard to 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 scale up so i'm not trying to find like mr i'm not mr doom by any means i work in a humanitarian space so my job is to find a problem and try to come up with a solution but uh, you guys have a lot of great ideas but it's just africa right now is a net food importer when it should have to be obviously but you know with conflict and things going on obviously with conflict or um the climate change and things of that nature people can't keep consistency and stay on the farm and grow um, you know, you were, you're, you're running from one um, crisis to the other at this moment in time. And with these overlapping crises, you know, as you mentioned, there's a farmers and a pastoralist, and there's a little bit of water. And as that water shrinks, you know, then obviously there's conflict and, and, and things of that nature. And, and tax revenues are down. You know, we talked about the Barbados, the Caribbean. Imagine some of those countries have 90 percent tourism. And if you lock the country up. Zimbabwe has 90% informal businesses. And now when you shut down the company, the country, how does it affect women? You know, because now they're not able to trade in the markets. So what do they eat? And then that's when you start having negative, negative coping mechanisms. And so you guys bring up a lot of good points. You people, you know. so I got to stop saying guys. I'm sorry. Um, everyone's bringing up a lot of good points. My apologies. Been, Dana, can I jump field. in just one more quick well, point? Of course, I, 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 I gotta leave. Uh, Carrie, thank you for that. Because um, you mentioned a, a very good point. The challenge we have, of course, is that Africa's food problem is not really the problem. But right. you also rightfully said they have great land. Right. So it's not the problem. Mm -hmm. And until we stop looking at the problems that we see or that are presented, and look at those as the impact of the problem, then we can really begin to address the problem. But we shouldn't let the problem that are presented about the, the, the impact that systemic discrimination towards Africa has had. And now all of a sudden we can't deal with the real issue because we have the problems that, that issue created. So, so well stated again, Bishop. Thank you very much. Very well articulated. Um, and oh, no, no, no. that goes Can back I? to a colonial legacy, I have yeah. to say, and, and really delivering uh, environmental justice. Another thing I see, uh, uh, I, I was in Ghana uh, earlier and um, you know, if you go around downtown Ghana, you see all of these advertisements for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, um, you know, so you're talking about uh, everybody knows this fat, you know, hypertension, diabetes, all of these other diseases. The same thing happened in the Caribbean. The Caribbean used to eat off the land and eat the fish. And now they, the Americans told the Caribbean, don't worry about the food. We're going to bring your food in. 
uh, we want you to work in the tourist sector. And so you got all these people who are now working in a, uh, the tourism sector uh, and not, you know, not growing food that they, you know, that they should grow. And then increasingly African uh, countries are using Africa to grow food but for markets in Europe or in Middle East or Asia, you know? Um, and so how is the land being used, the water and all that kind of thing? It's a, it's a multi-dimensional problem, it really is. And I wish that the Africa Union was stronger than it is. It's still, uh, you know, uh, the, the single voice for Africa to speak. Uh, I'm, one of the things I'm gonna look out for it during the summit is how is Africa gonna relate its problem? What are gonna be the, the top priorities coming from Africa uh, to the top area that you want to see the United States uh, impact and help out in. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty confident it won't be uh, you know, these issues. You know, it won't be, and it should be. <laughs> so that's where the, the problem lies. Yeah, thank you so much. We are looking forward, to, um, we'll keep our eyes out for the um, Africa Summit in, in early December. Uh, before that, um, I want to alert everybody that we will be having a, uh, an, another event with the ECCC with the voices from the hit Netflix documentary, Youth Be Gov. Tomorrow evening, the director and, and the lead co-counsel and youth plaintiff will be joining us for a discussion on a, on a um, historical lawsuit um, for, law, for, in, for environmental justice in the United States. In mid December, in this November, we have COP27 coming up and our next Climate Cafe will be coming to us directly from Egypt with our very own, um, our very own Sam Goodman, who will be reporting from, from COP27. And we're looking forward to that. We hope we'll, you will join us there. And we will keep our eyes out for the Africa um, conference in early December. Thank all of you, the Africa Committee, our new Africa Committee, so much for joining forces with us today. We are so grateful to Mr. Foote and um, Mr. Dickerson, for sharing their insight. I'm not sure we solved any problems, but we learned <laughs> so much tonight. Or more Thank you for reaching out to us, Dana. We appreciate it. Uh, this and was I will share the, the policy paper that Mel mentioned with you in case you want to distribute it. Thank you. We would be delighted to. We have a, uh, we can share it with the participants in, the, in this talk today. Also, we have an earth care toolkit on the ECCC website where we have a vast resource of um, policy papers, of information, um, how to go about lowering your carbon footprint, all kinds of information, videos, books, uh, YouTube links, um, if you want to learn more about climate change and environmental justice, please see our website at um, Democrats Abroad um, uh, ECCC. Thank you so much for joining us. I am going to end, um, end our recording now and uh, wish you all a good evening and uh, a good day wherever you are in the world. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you all. Bye-bye.